Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce tonight's talk with Kelly Weil, presenting her new book, Off the Edge, Flat Earthers, Conspiracy Culture, and Why People Will Believe Anything, joined in conversation by Dr. Joan Donovan. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our ever-expanding community. We host virtual events like tonight's five times a week, and you can find our event schedule on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question at any point during the event. We'll get through as many as time allows for. If you would like closed captions as well, uh, just click on the live transcript, transcript tab on your Zoom screen. So in just a moment, I'm going to be posting the link to purchase tonight's featured book, Off the Edge, in the chat box. Your book purchases make virtual author events like this possible, and they support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for tuning in tonight. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you have likely experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm going to do my best to resolve them quickly. So thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Journalist Kelly Weil has been called one of the best observers of the fringes of modern life. She is a leading media expert on the role of online conspiracy theories in current affairs. And at the Daily Beast, she covers extremism, disinformation, and the internet. Kelly has been featured on national and international news outlets such as ABC's Nightline, CNN, Al Jazeera, all covering flat earth and other digital fringes. Off the Edge is her first book. Tonight, she's joined in conversation by Dr. Joan Donovan, the director and lead researcher of the Technology and Social Change Research Project at Harvard Kennedy School. Her work in teaching focuses on media manipulation, disinformation campaigns, and adversarial media movements. Tonight, they'll be discussing Off the Edge, hailed by Science Magazine as beautiful and probing, Author Charlie Wurzel perfectly voices, though, why this book stands out. Quote, what sets Weil apart is her ability to cover her subjects with great empathy, all without losing sight of the enormous damage and personal consequences of their actions. We are so pleased to be hosting this event tonight. So without further ado, Kelly, the digital podium is yours to start us off with a reading. Thank you so much, Kate. I'm really excited to be here and uh, to share this book with you. And thank you so much, Joan. I'm really excited for this conversation. I think it's gonna be great. Um, here's my book. I'd like to start by reading a little bit from the beginning. And this introduces um, a man I met in the Flat Earth Movement named Mike Hughes. Yeah. The summer before he fell from the sky, Mike Hughes was experimenting with amateur jet propulsion it was going badly. Problem again today, he texted me in August, 2019. With a rocket or weather, I asked. Rocket. This was his second failure in two days and I'd lost count of the times he'd run into trouble with wind or parachutes or spare rocket parts he'd purchased off of Craigslist for $325. Most people would have given up years earlier and maybe taken up a less lethal hobby. I certainly thought he'd quit. He's gotta know, right? I remember asking my husband. I was standing in our kitchen, texting Hughes with one hand and brandishing a spatula with the other, making an omelet while trying to talk Hughes out of launching himself into low orbit. Deep down, he's got to know Earth is round. That's why he keeps having these rocket failures. Earth is round and he doesn't want to prove it. I liked Mike. He was an offbeat guy, but a good one. We'd met the previous year at a conference for people who believe the Earth is flat. I was there as a journalist for the Daily Beast, the news website where I reported on extremist movements and conspiracy theories. He was there to drum up support for a self-manned rocket launch into the upper atmosphere, during which he would decide the planet's shape for himself. He and I sat around talking trash and the particulars of rocket science. Throughout the next year, he'd send me updates, pictures of rocket designs, gossip from the conspiracy scene, and 
invitation to more conspiracy conventions. This wasn't a guy with a death wish. This was a man who lived six bombastic decades and had no intention of stopping. So when he texted me about a summer's worth of rocket troubles, I thought it was his good sense finally rebelling against the bad idea. After all, who truly believes Earth is flat? Um, I'm gonna leave it there. And I am so stoked to discuss this more with Joan. Well, it's been a while, uh, you know, since we, we last saw each other, but you made it through. I remember when this book was a dream, uh, it was an idea, it was a pitch. Um, but, you know, as I've known you over the years, there are many wild stories that you've covered, right? And you have covered everything from far right extremism, where I know you from, uh, to disinformation, to other kind of goofball things that are happening online. And I'd love to hear from you about, you know, your trajectory as a reporter before we get into the nuts and bolts of how the book ended up being the book. What was, what was on your mind? What were other possibilities? You know, how did you arrive at Flat Earth to tell the story, the bigger story that you do tell about conspiracy minded thinking and, and, and sort of the role it plays in American politics? Mm -hmm. That's right. You've uh, been kind of a sounding board from before this book was uh, even uh, anything on the page. But um, a lot of my trajectory as a reporter sort of dovetails with the origins of this book. I've been looking at the bad parts of the internet for a really long time. Um, you know, even before I was a reporter, when I was a kid, I was looking at 4chan when I shouldn't have been. And not because I uh, agree with its politics or find it a welcoming place, but I'm just interested in what's going on in the, the bleeding edge of weird. And mm -hmm. in uh, college, I became very involved in student journalism. I edited um, a student blog. We had to go through the ordeal of... Um, uh, Gamer Gators coming after some of our writers when I was managing it. So this was um, this was a real crash course for me in understanding that the horrible parts of the internet that I have always passively observed had very real um, in-person consequences. It was something that um, could strike back. You weren't just writing about it, you were involved in a certain capacity. And because I had that knowledge um, and because I was always, again, watching the bad parts of the internet, that became, um, as you know, a bit of a beat starting in mm -hmm. 2015, 2016. What was an obscure knowledge base of knowing how to navigate these forums suddenly became pretty relevant to navigating American politics. So um, my beat became more and more um, explaining what's going on on the far right, what's going on in the weird pockets of the internet. And um, it was during those, uh, those journeys that I first encountered Flat Earth. I, um, I was monitoring extremist forums and I started seeing just outlandish personalities, very far right personalities posting about Flat Earth theory. And I'm just like, no way are these people mm -hmm. serious. You know, I've seen them make crazy claims before, but flat earth is just a step too far. They're, they've got to be memeing. Mm -hmm. And so I started digging into it and I found that they were not joking at all. And that this was actually part of a, um, a rising movement. It had real world meetups and people who are extremely engaged in it. And I thought that it was a really interesting way of exploring how people can believe anything they set their minds to. And so for several years, it's sort of been um, a lens for me into how people believe. Amazing. I mean, anytime it gets brought up in my world, it's, it's kind of the punchline for how bizarre and strange the internet can be. But you know, as we talk about the more and more people become deluded, become exposed to misinformation, uh, 
there does seem to be really no limit to the the kinds of things people are willing to reject. But what's interesting about the book and, and about the way that we arrive at flat earth theory as something that is a bit of an internet phenomenon, similar to the claims that birds aren't real. Did you actually hear about this? Birds aren't real. They're just drones <laughs> that I have these the, really yeah, pretty feathers. I talked feathers. to the guy years ago, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. but you know, you kind of associate it with internet stuff and then you stop and think and you remember historically, there was something about this guy, Christopher Columbus, right? Where he he thought maybe he'd sail off the side of the earth, right? And so what's the history here? So the history of Flat Earth is really interesting. And I, I think the Columbus narrative, the fact that it, that is so widely believed really says something about um, you know how we teach theories and how we maybe make fun of ones that seem outlandish because actually we've known for a couple thousand years that earth is round more than a couple. Um, and that's because it's very easy to prove with, you know, basic observations, pretty easy math. Um, so by Columbus's day, people knew earth was round and we've since gone back and sort of um, messed with our own memory of that. And when flat earth really emerged as a theory it wasn't around Columbus's day, but was actually in the 1800s. We got somebody who I think maybe you and I would recognize as a, a proto YouTuber, a man ahead of his time, who was, you know, he was a, um, his name is Samuel Robotham. He was a huckster of miracle cures. He, uh, he sold uh, like fake uh, soda pops that he said could cure all ailments. And he pivoted from that sort of Alex Jones like, uh, um, snake oil salesman persona to starting to sell flat earth theory, which he developed um, on this commune that he led that failed. It's, I, mm -hmm. it's in the book. Um, show me a like, successful commune and I will show you a flat earth theory. And yeah, probably this snake one lasted oil. about two years. They had, they had a bad. huge problem with drunkenness and a hermit who wouldn't move out of a cave. It's, um, you know, it happens, yes, <laughs> but yes, in this context, um, Samuel Robotham started promoting what was at the time even a very ridiculous theory that earth was flat. And he started writing pamphlets. He expanded those pamphlets into books and uh, launched a lecture circuit where he charged uh, per ticket to get in. And that started gaining something of a cult following. A lot of the people who showed up at his lectures were just there to make fun of him for sure, but he ended up converting some people. And for those most diehard of converts, it really became um, a way of life for them. And unfortunately, the theory has stuck around in some incarnation since then. Amazing. So let's fast forward to the age, the age of the internet and the way in which you enter into this field. Um, I remember probably two years ago now, you tweeting from a flat earth conference and I was like, well, that's brave, right? <laughs> Not only are you there, you're letting people know that you're there. So well, can you talk about the experience of the uh, participant observation and the communities and the events you attended? And, and uh, it seems like you had been getting pretty close with some of these folks as a as a journalist, um, and we're we're really getting to know the the ins and outs of their lives and the people that cared about them. And so, you know, drop us in to the Flat Earth Conference and tell me what it's like. It's weird. I'll tell you what. Um, you know, so I I went to my first Flat Earth Conference in um, 2018, and it was huge. It was in uh, it was in Aurora, Colorado. Um, and there are about 600 paid attendees, you know, a handful of media, um, but overwhelmingly you were the only person in the room who believed earth was a globe. And that was a really um, unnerving realization um, to realize that, you know, I, I have just this huge gulf in my um, perceived reality from everybody else in this room. And I also realized that that's probably how a lot of them feel in an everyday context. Um, you know, they are used to being the only flat earthers in the room. But to that effect, 
because it, they were finally all in one room together, there was this huge sense of community. And I think that's especially important in the conspiracy world because these theories very inherently propose that, um, you know, we're just a small set of truth seekers and it's us against the world. We're the only people who know the reality. And so when you get all these folks together, it was almost celebratory. Um, it has a very weird vibe, you know, people playing guitar in the halls and um, almost festival like, but it was unnerving when you realized what they were celebrating. And um, yeah, and it's, when I go to these conferences, I'm always very explicit about who I am and what I believe. I'm not ever gonna pose as a flat earther because I, you know, as a journalist, I don't think that's right. Um, and you, know, you mentioned uh, it being brave about tweeting from there. And, you know, there is some initial antagonism that I've found when interviewing flat earthers, but I've found that often after the first few minutes of them trying to pitch me on whatever new argument they have, it becomes a very personal conversation. And a lot of flat earthers um, have, feel like they've suffered for their beliefs or they have um, a tale of woe connected to flat earth and they really just wanted to tell it to me. They wanted someone to listen. So it was weird and then it got really personal in almost every instance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And as you're talking to them and interviewing them, one of the concepts in your book that comes up is this notion of going down the rabbit hole and people are, are brought into this, right? What, what does it take, you know, in these stories that people are telling you to get someone to start to question this sort of fundamental fact that you learn you know, kindergarten, you're drawing a circle, they say, okay, now draw the ocean. And, and you're like, okay, yeah, the earth is round, right? And like, you know, as a kid, maybe you pick up the paper and think, okay, not round, but like round, like a disc and flat. Um, and so as a child, you kind of learn your way out of this, you see representations of globes and whatnot. But what does it take, or, you know, in these stories, what are people communicating about how that reality becomes broken in that mm -hmm. moment uh, where they start to question, well, is the earth round? And I'm not going to say nothing, but I do see that globe behind you as <laughs> a subtle dog. You know, I've got to, like I said, I've got to be upfront about my beliefs. Yeah. So there's my yeah. globe <laughs> propaganda on display. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. And a lot of them will share a really similar path to this belief. Um, in fact, in one way, it's extremely striking almost everybody I've interviewed has come to the theory via YouTube. And that's not just me talking to the right people. There have been researchers I've met at Flat Earth conferences and they're asking people mostly that one question, how'd you find this? And the answer is YouTube. Um, people will be watching videos with a, um, of a different subject matter. Uh, I've met people who were watching astronomy videos, people who are watching religious videos, people who are watching uh, videos about slightly different conspiracy theories. I know 9-11 is a common one that people have been watching before YouTube's algorithm recommended a flat earth video to them. And we can um, sort of intuit why that pattern keeps emerging. And YouTube's algorithm will not necessarily recommend the thing that's most related to your video, but it will recommend the thing that it thinks you actually want to watch. And it, it's it's um, often a very dark mirror of um, our worst impulses and our worst interests because it shows often these very sensational videos, the things that you know we actually are going to click on. And I think I'm guilty of that to an extent. It's two in the morning and I see a video with a crazy title. There's a good chance I'll click on it. Conspiracy theories performed really well in that recommendation matrix. Um, and especially flat earth. So, so many um, flat earthers I've met felt like the theory found them. They didn't go looking. It just appeared on their screen. They often use these very passive terms. It appeared, it, it just started mm -hmm. auto playing. Um, so, and many of them will, again, they'll say, 
you know, I, I wasn't a flat earther going into this. Um, I thought it was crazy when I first heard about it. And then I started listening more. And you mentioned the term rabbit hole. Um, and it's a term that I think um, some of us in the um, trying to, in the space where we're trying to counter disinformation use it. But I've also heard conspiracy theorists use it as well, saying, I went down the rabbit hole of this information. And, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting term. And it definitely does describe in some ways the process of pursuing an idea all the way to the end and going down this weird trippy path to find more information. But I, I was, I don't know why I was so struck by hearing flat earthers invoke the term. And I think it's because it's, um, it's a very passive construction. You know, you would fall down a rabbit hole like Alice. It's something that happens just as a, uh, an incident of gravity. Although sidebar flat earthers mostly don't believe in gravity. Um, okay. <laughs> but it, it sort of removed people's uh, complicity in looking for more information. So I thought that was really interesting that a lot of flat earthers will describe themselves as having been led here. And it's this truth that revealed itself to them that they weren't really trying to find it at all. And mm -hmm. I do sort of question that, um, that construction. Well, what's interesting, I think, um, you know, as someone who's done a lot of time researching YouTube and in the way in which the algorithm works, and I'll tell you that my my computer thinks I'm a white supremacist, right? I go on YouTube and instantly it's like, oh, we got, you know, a dozen new videos for you, Joan, and you're going to like every one of them. And it's like, as you research something like this, you end up, the algorithms, the way that your computer behaves, uh, even my Amazon account started recommending to me uh, uh, Nazi-like paraphernalia. And um as I was thinking about it, I was like, oh yeah, the rabbit hole, like there's something about the way algorithms, uh, literally titled reinforcement algorithms are able to, once you watch a video, cause you're curious, it keeps trying to send that video. You know, I'll tell, tell people uh, tonight, if you want to experiment with changing the algorithm, watch about a dozen videos of cats eating pizza. And then look at, you know, over the next couple of days, YouTube every once in a while is like, I know you're looking at this, you know, Rihanna video and you're, and you're loving this, you know, new video by uh, Beyonce. But remember, you really liked cats eating pizza. You really did enjoy that. And for, for someone like Flat Earthers, where they come in, it's curious, it's interesting. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what they're convinced by. What sure. seems convincing? So it's, it's tough to make a case for flat earth theory because it's just complete nonsense, you know, yeah. but I don't think people are convinced because it's the most scientifically accurate um, argument or that it makes the most compelling argument. What it does instead is it pokes holes or attempts to poke holes in people's perception of the globe. Um, and for some people, I think that, um, what we might call like an argument from ignorance is actually really interesting. They are more interested in attempted debunkings of the globe than they are seeing people support their own argument for flat earth. So a lot of flat earthers will tell you that, well, they got into the theory, they became a believer because they tried to debunk flat earth and they couldn't do it. Now, again, grain of salt, because it's very easy to debunk flat earth. You want to Let's all get in the bus. We're going to go to the beach. We're going to watch the sunset over the horizon. It's very easy to do. Um, but they have been convinced by uh, trick camera trickery, by mathematical equations that I don't think would hold up to any scrutiny, arguments that are hard to dismiss because they don't know exactly what to question. And because these arguments are less about, again, proving flat earth than they are questioning the round earth, people get lured into them and um, become pretty convinced because it's more about sowing doubt and that's ultimately what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not convinced yet that the earth is flat, but 
I have been to California and it seems like the ocean does go on forever and ever and ever. Am I right? You it just look at like it that. and it looks like it just keeps going and then it must just drop off. Let's just go like that. You know, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just it just seems logical, right? I think too in this moment, um, you know, and I'd love to hear more about researching this during the pandemic, especially as that community that you talked about at the conferences and the affirmations that one feels by finally being believed by by talking to other people about this. What happens to flat Earth during COVID and during the pandemic? Do people turn to other conspiracy theories? Do they incorporate new conspiracies into their belief systems? I think yes and yes. Um, you know, we saw what at least anecdotally seemed to be a huge surge in conspiracy beliefs during the COVID era. And I think there's two reasons for that. A lot of conspiratorial thinking happens because people um, are afraid and they don't feel like they have enough information or they feel like the information they're presented with doesn't um, doesn't really affirm their priors. It doesn't uh, support what they already wanted to believe. So they go looking for alternative answers. Um, and the other reason I think conspiracy theories appeared to boom during COVID was people were spending a lot more time online, a bit more time away from those uh, the grounding influences of people who can say, hey, man, that's just stop talking about that. That's weird. And more time with that uh, YouTube algorithm and whatever uh, interesting Facebook groups they were joining. Um, so yes, I think there was um, an increase in conspiracy belief during COVID necessarily. I think that um, helped Flat Earth. They were posting more, but they also started incorporating a lot more other theories. I've noticed during the COVID era, maybe a little bit before too, um, there's been something going on. I think and the journalist Anna Merlin summarized it really nicely. She called it the conspiracy singularity. And over the past couple of years, I think we've noticed a lot more cross-pollination between conspiracy movements. Um, I think they're becoming a lot savvier about how to link to each other and how to recruit across conspiracy lines. So the uh, flat earth groups that I was in maybe three years ago that were a bit more narrowly focused on the theory and posting supposed proofs and railing against the globe heads. Um, now they'll post a lot of things that are kind of QAnon light, even if they don't invoke that theory's name, they'll start posting about, you know, um, Satanism and child eating and just, things that I recognize from other conspiracy theories that indicate to me that they're dabbling elsewhere. Um, and I've also seen this take place in person. I was at a Flat Earth conference in 2019 and these two women were walking around trying to give out jewelry to other women. They approached me. Um, I'm like, hey, what's this? Why are you giving me free things? I don't trust that at all. Um, and I looked and it was a little Livestrong bracelet with a Q bangle hanging off it. I'm like, what is this? And they're like, well, you know, we're just here to spread the word about, um, about this very important movement that's taking place. I'm like, are you flat earthers? And they're like, no, but we thought that this group might be receptive. I'm like, I mean, that is probably correct um, that, you know, if you're into flat earth, you are more likely than the average person to be receptive to QAnon. But that's also, um, it's very cynical, I think, and very frightening that um, conspiracy movements are recognizing each other as fellow travelers, even if their beliefs don't strictly support each other, they, um, they see possible recruits in them. And so, yeah, I think, um, all of these movements are getting a little broader and maybe have a bit um, more fellow travelers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting to me too, as we talk about the growth of conspiracy culture, because I think I'm of the mind that you would agree with that uh, everybody's, uh, it's, it's sort of normally human to be skeptical, critical, not necessarily to take something on authority, but want to see the evidence, want to see for yourself. Uh, and especially during the pandemic, we saw this explosion of different kinds of conspiracy theories coming together um, 
from the great reset to the pandemic. So these ideas that elites had invented COVID in order to uh, uh, conduct population control to the pandemic where it was the Democrats had invented COVID to control the US election um, and to get rid of Trump. And, and it, it seems to me though, that there's, there's something happening here with the internet that's just, it's just different. Um, which is to say that in every city, town, you might have a few people that think these thoughts and the likelihood that they would find one another and be in the right frame of mind and context to bring up this crazy thing I heard, right, is, uh, is frankly, pretty, would be pretty special, right? But the way that the internet is designed, the way in which we find each other through keywords, the way in which hashtags work, these people that are uh, probably very sparsely located uh, it collapse distance by using Facebook groups and YouTube channels. So tell us a little bit about um, as you're going through and looking at flat earth theory and, and there's this moment of the pandemic where you're going less and less out into the world talking to people. Where are you finding these folks? Where are you gathering data? Uh, how are you, how are you finding the next interview? Um, I mean, fortunately when the pandemic hit, I had established a lot of real world ties, which was helpful. Um, but when I go looking for new flat earth information, it's unfortunately, it's very easy to find. And, um, Facebook, YouTube, and Telegram, um, are, really uh, rich sources for this. And to the um, point that you make about community, about keywords, I think that's really important because it does, um, it, it does collapse this very fringe belief that, you know, flat earthers um, percentage wise are not a large uh, percent of the population, but they are enough to fill a convention hall when there's one big must attend event every year and they are enough to join a very large group when the stakes are just as low as hitting the uh the like button on facebook and you know i think that's really interesting um that sort of geographic idea of it and it's not something i'd considered that much but we're seeing right now yes this um, convergence of people from online movements into IRL spaces where they um, are much louder than they actually are uh, in a, you know, a sample size of the population. I'm really thinking about like the uh, trucker convoy in Canada, where those people protesting were not representative of either um, majority opinion over COVID prevent, uh, precautions in Canada, and they weren't representative of Canadian truckers, about 90% of whom were vaccinated. Um, but even though they were, by definition, um, you know, statistical fringe, their convergence in one place and their convergence in large vehicles that take up the space of, you know, 200 people, um, was able to kind of manipulate perceptions. I think that's a really interesting way of, of framing it. And um, again, you wouldn't run into 600 flat earthers uh, just in the wild, at least in one place, but these days you absolutely can at a hotel. Sorry, I was muted. There's another person in the office, so I had to shut my door. Um, so one question I have then, um, as we go into Q&A, and anybody feel free to use the Q&A uh, button on Zoom to type your question in, and I will ask it as gently as possible, so uh, be cool. Um, and it, it, so, so, okay, there are people who believe the earth is flat. What's the harm in that? Like, who, who should care? Like, why do we care about that? Oh, someone's wrong on the internet, Kelly. Go write a book about it. What, uh, what's if, at stake? If only I could write a book every time someone was wrong on the internet. No, you know, I think, I think there were three main harms um, of flat earth theory specifically. Um, one, well, one I think is very relevant to other theories, but that 
it um it results in a lot of alienation and isolation in conspiracy theorists' lives. If you go all in on flat earth, you're going to get social backlash from the people in your real life. Um, it's, it's a strange thing to believe. And a lot of flat earthers don't just believe in, you know, a kind of happy go lucky way. They are very militant about it. Um, and they need to preach it to other people in their lives. That puts them uh, at odds with people. Um, and I think that erosion of those social ties is really dangerous. I think we need those real world connections and they help us, you know, maintain a shared reality. So that's one, I think, very personal problem. Another one, um, you heard me read about Mike Hughes in the beginning of my book. He's one of several people I've met who are doing just extremely inadvisable things to prove their theory. They are, um, he was launching himself on a rocket. I've met men who say that they're going to have these big treks across Antarctica to find the edge. Um, and sometimes it's not even so life or death, but that people are throwing a lot of money at Flat Earth. Or I met someone who went to jail because he was handing out Flat Earth pamphlets at a grade school playground when school is in session. It has, you know, real um, legal and life-defining harms. And then I think the third risk is that people don't typically just stick with one conspiracy theory. Um, because when you accept something as just all-encompassing as flat earth, you're going to go looking for other theories that fit your belief profile. And unfortunately, there are a lot more um, bigoted theories on um, for sale. You know, we talked about QAnon, which it, it, it's almost hard to describe it in frank terms because it's really appalling. It claims falsely that you know prominent Democrats are trafficking and maybe eating children, um, and it's the basis for a lot of people's uh, outright political violence. Um, there are also a lot of conspiracy theories that are um, weaponized against disenfranchised populations, against um, ethnic and religious minorities. And I've seen a, a disturbing number of flat earth Nazis. They're absolutely not you know, the majority in that movement, but a disturbing number of people who've uh, been able to reconcile this belief that we are being lied to about the earth's shape and that um, that the Jewish people are involved in the cover-up. So I think um, that potential to lure people across conspiracy lines really opens the door to a lot more nefarious and immediately harmful beliefs than flat earth. That's disturbing, but also tracks with uh, some of the research that we've been doing over the last year on uh, meme wars and who gets involved in meme wars and how uh, meme wars are generally pretty bad for the people who participate in them. Uh, if you think about a meme war like QAnon, for instance, trying to get people to think about QAnon and trying to spread the word about QAnon, people, are, people do take it very, very seriously and enough so that they are willing to sacrifice family. They're willing to, to do anything to, to keep the meme alive. And I've got a question here from Barry about uh, this. It sounds like there are qualities of addiction in subscribing to such conspiratorial beliefs. And he's wondering if some people have treated it as such and trying to bring people back away from these lines and beliefs. And is it something that, you know, it, it, I feel like I'm Barry. I'm going to answer part of the question because it's it's. I got to give Kelly a small break here. Um, but when I think about how people become enmeshed in conspiracy theories, a lot of it has to do with how they think society is organized and what role that they play in society as well. Um, and it's a way of giving over control and saying, well here's this thing and I don't have to be responsible for it, you know, but I now know some kind of forbidden knowledge, right? And that I've now have access to a truth that nobody else believes. And in some ways that can be really enticing. It can get you pretty stoked, right? It can really like 
trigger some endorphins if you think you you know think about a journalist with a scoop right <laughs> you know it's like once you're the only once you believe that you're the only person who knows or you're a part of a small subset of people who know um it does become you know a hunt for the next piece of uh viable forbidden information and so wh what do you think kelly about the ways in which people might be uh brought back from this and we also have an anonymous question asking it similarly um have anybody been reconvinced that the earth is round and uh, what kind of approaches uh might be successful in in treating this you know if you think about it as an addiction or you think about it as uh, a problem where people maybe need to be introduced to facts mm -hmm. I, I do think that addicting nature is a very real component and not just flat earth, but a lot of conspiracy theories. People like to feel as though they're almost in a, a role playing game where they're doing a puzzle and they're fitting all these pieces together and that if they just find the next clue, things will make more sense. And of course, there is no greater picture or what they're trying to build to is a complete lie. But um, to that latter point, I have met former flat earthers, people who have come back. And I'm sure there are a lot more than I've met. I think people are often a little embarrassed after they denounce flat earth and they leave very quietly. Um, but there were some striking similarities in the interviews I had um, with these former flat earthers. And they told me that one thing that helped them a lot um, well, let me take a step back. I don't think people can be just forced out of a conspiracy belief. Um, if these were rational thoughts, then people would, you know, not uh, flock to them. It's people are believing these theories because it does provide them something. But in the case of, so I, I think they need to be willing to change their minds on some level. And in the case of the people I spoke to who had left Flat Earth, they said, they left after having um, productive conversations with round earthers that were not in a debate format. Um, and one thing you'll find if you go looking for flat earth content on YouTube, for instance, there's a lot of these flat earth round earth debate videos. I think they're completely counterproductive. I don't think there's even any merit in framing flat earth versus round earth as a debate because they're not two equally valid sides. Um, and they're also counterproductive because rather than get convinced, people just entrench themselves in their position because they don't want to be seen losing. So when these discussions were actually productive, they were compassionate and they were, um, they were talks and they addressed why people actually came to that theory, not just what evidence was compelling to them, but you know, social aspects as well. Um, so I think, treating um, treating it, yes, almost as an addiction or almost as one expert I spoke to said, almost like um, how you might help someone leave a, a cult or an abusive um, social setting. Those are helpful relationships. And um, on the flip side or component to this is uh, multiple people told me that it helps that they had compassionate people waiting for them when they got out. And that they had friends and family who weren't going to say like, uh, remember when you went flat earth, I'm going to make fun of you for that for the next five decades. People who said, hey, like, we're glad you came around. Welcome back. Um, and I think that's important because when we talk about themes of alienation, those can drive people further into a conspiracy theory because suddenly that conspiracy community is all they have. And if there's an alternative, I think it's easier for people to leave. It's really interesting. You know, one of the things that um, when we do research on radicalized communities, especially the far right, everybody wants to know, well, how do you get them to be less racist? How do you get them to stop believing in these hateful things? And, and time and time again, you know, the process of radicalizing someone, especially when the internet's involved, tends to be sort of this mass self-radicalization. People are finding information, they're moving through different websites, they're reading different blogs, but it, getting somebody to come back from that or to come to a different conclusion, that is some high touch, you know, patience that is, that is required. There's no way to get somebody to come back from that, especially if they're denying things that 
they once always believed like that the earth is is mm -hmm. round and um, one one yeah. one add on to that is um it, it can also be very difficult from the de-radicalization side when the conspiracy theory that someone's involved in is more hateful than flat earth you know flat earth we can kind of show evidence and maybe have a more frank discussion but when a theory is maybe politically motivated or is um, bigoted in nature, I think you do have to sort of prioritize your safety and your sanity. Um, so it becomes, again, very difficult, I think, to maintain those ties. Um, and, you know, I think the, maybe the best thing you can do is kind of have a, a grounding village for people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a two-way street. The person needs to want to come back. Amazing. So Saul's asking a pretty funny question. I actually want to know the answer. What do flat earthers believe happens if you step off the edge of the earth? So um, I know that's the title of my book. And um, the punchline, I think, is that you can't. Or, um, oh. well, let me, let me set it up here. Basically, flat earthers, although there are some competing models, broadly believe that we live on a disk and there's an ice wall around the outside. So that in itself is why water doesn't just flow over the edge. Um, and they also, most of them believe that that universe is enclosed in a solid dome. And that dome is really interesting because most of them believe that that is the extent of the universe. There's no space outside it. Everything is under this little snow globe and that's it. Uh, it's a very religious theory. They believe, you know, that's all of creation, et cetera. So, <laughs> To that effect, you can't go off the edge because there's nothing. You've hit the wall, um, almost Truman style. But they will then start asking, or rather, you should start asking them, well, what if you do go and try and find the wall? Can I go, you know, knock on it? And they'll have a lot of excuses for why you can't get far out enough on the ice. And they'll point to, um, oh, like treaties about how you can't fully colonize Antarctica and they'll say that's actually a pretense for having a whole standing army there and if you get too close to the wall then you're gonna get mowed down <laughs> I'm like I just don't think that's accurate <laughs> um I know and how have a, never none of us seen this army like you know where's TMZ when you need them right yeah so, somebody so was crazy. offering flat earthers uh like ten thousand dollar tickets and he'd take them to the wall he said he was you know former security guard there um, and then he cut and ran with the money. So we'll never know. That's a good grift. I mean, if you can, yeah. if you can get people to pay an exorbitant amount of money, like Firefest, and then not deliver, I mean, oh, no. as long as you don't get caught, right? Let's not get caught. Flat Even interesting. Firefest. <laughs> yeah, Firefest would be, I mean, nobody's here for those cheese sandwiches, right? Um, so one of the questions asks, uh, you know, that flat earthers tend to get involved in other conspiracy theories. Is there a typical starter conspiracy theory that gets people going and gets them into this world? Um, the most common that I've come across has been 9-11 truth. Um, and I, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe because I think it has such a far reaching interest. It's not specifically a right-wing conspiracy theory, it has a lot of dabblers across the political spectrum. Um, but that that might be changing. Um, when I was asking people about that, it was in person um, and we haven't been in person for a hot minute now. Um, yeah. So I think that maybe political conspiracy theories like QAnon or adjacent ones might be uh, larger feeders right now, but I don't have like stats on that but in the past 9 11 these days when i see links to flat earth communities it's in QAnon. interesting you know when we study um like white male radicalization into white nationalist movements it usually begins with like the first red pill is always women are denying you love and happiness you deserve mm -hmm. everything you want women are denying you sex the second red pill is always 
uh, these groups that are not white are, you know, getting the benefits of government, they're getting into school over you, you're going to be a, a neat your whole life, like not an education uh, or training. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's weird to see that that pattern then leads into the third red pill, which is always anti-Semitic, something about, you know, Jewish control of media or governments. And we see that progression time and time again. And what's interesting about it is that you can actually map those patterns now on the on internet. You can watch and look at people's YouTube histories and see that they've gone from yes. this set of conspiracy theories to this set of conspiracy theories. And uh, and over time, it just gets more and more more extreme and more and more isolating and and um, sort of tougher and tougher to break down those barriers. And so. Uh, you know, it, it, it would be nice to be able to say, oh, well, if people want to believe in flat earth and that's the worst it's going to be, then sure, it should be fine. But when you look at the things that are surrounding it, other things that are being recommended, uh, the other spaces and places and people that they would be communicating with, I think uh, then you start to wonder if if flat earth is, is maybe just a, um, a sort of entry point. And I'd love to hear you talk uh, a little bit about celebrities and Flat Earth and Kyrie Irving and just this idea that Flat Earth has really entered pop culture. It has. Um, you know, it's funny. There are, it's so hard to tell when a celebrity who endorses Flat Earth is serious. I think Kyrie R was serious because he backed off of it. And then he said, you know, I did my research, turns out it's round. Oh, by the way, I'm also an anti-vaxxer. You know, that kind mm -hmm. of fits the profile to me of somebody who is earnestly dabbling in flat earth. But I think there is a bit more cynical attention seeking. Um, Tila Tequila was at least at one point talking about flat earth, but she would do other things that were just vile publicity stunts. I think she said that she was Hitler reincarnated. And again, you know, we were just talking about uh, flat earth neo-Nazis, but um, sometimes I think celebrities will drop that for attention. Um, mm -hmm. And in that case, I think it's, uh, I think it's just indefensible. You know, it's, um, it's uh, what I've observed to be in some time, in some cases, a life ruining theory. Um, and so to act it out like that um, for clout and for, you know, a couple clickbait articles, I think is just beyond the pal. So I'm going to ask one last question and, and feel free to throw in any other comments before we hand it back over to Kate. Um, but I wanted to know as you wrote this book, and there's an interesting question in the chat that mirrors my own thinking. What do you hope, who do you hope reads this book? You hope that people in the flat earth movement read it and are, uh, feel as if they've, they've been heard and represented, even if uh, you're challenging some of their belief systems. Uh, uh, who, what do you think is going to happen there? I mean, I would adore it if that happened. Um, I think I've been quite honest, both in my reporting process while I was writing this and in my representations of people. So if this helps find anyone, um, I would be very, very happy to hear that. Um, at the same time, though, I didn't write it for Flat Earthers. Um, I wrote it because I so often encounter this uh, misconception that conspiracy theorists are dumb or they're tinfoil hatters. Um, and that, you know, if you, all you need are the right facts and logic and they'll snap right back out of it. And that's not the truth. I mean, conspiracy thinking is um, to some degree a thought process we're all susceptible to. And I think when we understand it better um, and understand what's motivating people to be very obviously wrong, then maybe we can start to address it more holistically um, and uh, take a, um, a more honest look at its role in our lives and how we can maybe find our way out of this. That's a really good note to end on. I mean, if we can find our way out of, you know, this ice wall first, right? I mean, we are going to have to get some equipment to scale that wall. Uh, and I'm then ready. we might, let's, you know, like if we're stuck under the dome, we're stuck under the dome, right? It, it is what it is. Uh, Kate, I'd love to, to give it to you to wrap up. 
Oh, thank you tremendously to both of you for this fascinating conversation. Um, I learned so much and I'm, I love that you ended on common misconceptions. Um, I think that really fits the theme of empathy in your book, Kelly. But um, thank you everyone out there for joining us tonight and for asking such thoughtful and intelligent questions um, for spending your evening with us. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, have a great night, uh, keep reading and please be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.